Hi, folks. Uh, I know we got a couple people joining in. Um, we've got um, everyone on mute just to avoid the background noise situation and that you can send me questions through the, the chat panel or the Q&A um, goes directly to me. So you can either share some thoughts on the chat panel and that's open to everybody. You can also send it directly to me or just send me a Q&A throughout the session. I'll be pausing throughout. You'll also get a recording um, of this session after, afterwards for your reference, as well as a tip sheet that I'll show you. Uh, I am going to jump right, right in. I know sometimes uh, we, we wait for folks to kind of join in, but I want to be thoughtful. I know that this is uh, dinner, getting close to dinner time, end of day for folks, as well as people on the East Coast. This is later in the evening. So um, we'll go through it. If for some reason people miss the beginning part, they'll be able to listen to the recording. So uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, today's topic is going to be performance feedback, but particularly in um, during COVID-19, which is, has been, um, for, for lack of a better way of saying it, just you know, rough on people and confusing and a lot of different other things. Uh, and especially when it comes to performance feedback, what I've noticed is there's just been this experience of, in the beginning, not talking about performance at all. And in fact, when I was working with clients, I would even say, you know, um, now's not the time to talk about whether or not uh, some a deadline's being met or um, those types of things. People are scared and concerned and worried. And in the beginning, it really was a little tone deaf to talk about performance. However, we're now in, you know, a good five months now of, of this happening. And um, we can't keep operating, waiting for clarity to come and certainty because I've got a feeling for a while that's not going to be the case. So I'm going to walk through today uh, a couple of tips around well, how do you handle it? Feel free to send me questions throughout this entire session. I'll be pausing. I'll be giving you some questions to think about, but I'll be checking the chat and the, and the Q&A to make sure that I address all of those. Um, so don't worry if it, if it lines up with what I'm showing, you can feel free to, to throw in whatever questions you had to make sure that we get them answered for you during today's session. Okay, so a uh, little overview of what we're gonna cover today. First, we're gonna review what's different today and what to consider when discussing performance. We're gonna clarify what to align performance expectations to, because whatever you started off in January, um, it's really not where things are now. And uh, I'm gonna pop myself on video so you can see that I'm a human. Um, and provide practical tips to engage in performance dialogue right now. So let's get started. So I've got a question for all of you. You can feel free to send your answer in the chat. But what do you think is different today for performance management uh, from what it was in 2019? Go ahead and answer it. Uh, throw, it could be anything. Um, so you, you closed out December 2019. A lot of you probably did performance reviews. What, what, what do you see right now? That's, okay, so someone said um, a need to be more sensitive. Someone sent me a, a comment um, where it's just whatever we started off doing in January is just, it's no longer. So not even really sure what to tie your, 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 your ship to, so to speak. Um, I need to be more, uh, Working online, absolutely. Employees are not able to do the work they usually do. Yeah, there's a, a, a range of excuses. Oh, I love, ooh, now we're getting into it. Um, different expectations most likely and need to change goals. Yeah, so um, questioning the foundation of the performance, need to, to reinvent, uh, absolutely. Um, with the employees of, of not being able to do the work that they usually do, you've got a, you've got a wide range of that. You've got people, um, you know, ex I was actually going to say that some, some can't do the work because they have their kids at home. And uh, so it's very different. I think it's easy to think like, well, just, you know, schedule something with them. And, you know, a lot of people with much younger children, that's a completely different ballgame. And so everyone's situation's very different. And then you've also got people who um, actually come down with the coronavirus. And during that time, it's not a normal flu. We're seeing people have it and maybe can come back to work, but then they have these long bouts of exhaustion. Um, you know, I'll share that I actually um, had the coronavirus a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, I was very fortunate to have mild symptoms, but I've just noticed the lingering exhaustion is there. I'm definitely not as productive as what I was before. So 
there's just a weird malaise and everyone's got kind of a different scenario. But I also want to throw back to the idea of range of excuses. It's harder to, to get a connection. It's harder to tell whether or not what they're doing. Um, you know, is it a situation where they're, they're avoiding the work or just kind of taking advantage of the scenario? I will say for most situations, I'm finding people actually are almost overworking versus underworking. However, what I've, in some of the teams that I've worked with, if there were trust issues and performance issues before um, all of this happened, then working from home and being separate from everything and being able to kind of disconnect or even put further distance between yourself and, and a manager that if there was not a, a solid connection and a trust there that they were um, productive on the job, then yes, that this kind of exacerbated. It's not like they went home and they went, now I'm gonna be super productive. So those performance issues are still there. It's just harder to address because you can't see them uh, in person the same way. So let's talk about what to do. Um, okay, so um, the differences that I wanna, I wanna throw out, and a lot of them, uh, all of you highlighted, uh, but one, um, the only clear goal that people seem to have is surviving the unknown. Everybody is really focused on, well, I don't know, we're waiting to see if the state's gonna open up, we're waiting to see if the schools are gonna open up, we're waiting to see what's gonna, you know, if we're gonna go back into the offices. And, you know, uh, for those of you in California, there was, I, I talked to a lot of clients that were geared up and, and ready and had assessed what's it gonna take and they, they got everything in place and then all of a sudden it got rolled back and um, not everybody's going back into the office because we're having a second wave of things. So this idea of we're just trying to you know live day to day. And I think in the first month, first maybe two months, that made sense, but continuing to operate that is, is operate that way is almost now we're starting to develop a habit of reactivity. We wanna move away from that. Um, competing expectations and policies causing confusion. So we've got federal, state, city, and then you've got company policies, and then you've got people at home that have, their spouses have different policies. My boyfriend is considered a, an essential worker. He works for Frito-Lay, so everybody wants their chips. He definitely hasn't had a day off since all this happened. Um, and, and, and their policies are very different because they're all about getting people back out in the field. Um, collaborating with others will never be the same. Doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad. I think there's some um, clients that I've worked with that they've actually started better communication because of everything that's happened. People have kind of bonded a little bit uh, where there maybe wasn't as much trust or there was friction. People have kind of connected a little bit more. Um, however, there does seem to be a different energy pool of being on Zoom videos um, or team videos, whatever platform you're using, but being on those virtual videos it seems to take a different level of energy than sitting in a room with a group of people in meetings. Now, not to say that that's not exhausting, um, but I think there's something about there's not the same energy give and take as when you're in a room and you're getting that genuine human contact. Uh, there's just something to that 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 um, you have. To, that's where you're seeing this kind of Zoom exhaustion because they're technically not in more face-to-face -face situations, it's that being on a Zoom just requires a different, I don't know, it's just a different level of engagement. Um, difficult to know what action to take because we don't know what to expect. And then we, we, you all touched on this, personal life can't be um, separated from the, the business decisions anymore. Before it used to, you could kind of say, you know, we brought up childcare earlier, um, you could kind of say, well, you know what, your childcare situation is kind of your personal business and then, you know, some companies provided childcare, some companies kind of promoted that in their culture, they're very family centric, but, but by and large, companies didn't have to spend too much outside of the realm of maternity leaves and things like that. Um, thinking about whether or not your kids were in school or if you had a babysitter. And now we have situations where organizations are asking people to come back to work and the schools are, um, at least, you know, I know here in LA, and some of you might be having different experiences in different states, but um, the schools are basically going to be closed for this next semester. And so for those with younger kids that you can't leave them alone at home, um, either the, the cost of childcare that maybe you didn't have to pay for before, or even just the availability because of everything going on, uh, is just something that we have to think of. So what do we do about that? Um, the first thing I'm gonna just advise everybody to do is you, you've got to pick a destination at this point. Uh, the idea that we're, and the reason I've got this picture for those of you who I've worked with closely and I see a few of you on there, um, the, the more the ocean is storming, the 
you just getting tossed around and you see this, this, this boat here getting tossed around, um, the, the more exhausting it is. It's, you know, you've got to think to a level of people came to work at your organization, were inspired probably by the mission of the organization. Sure, there's probably a few who just came for the job because it was convenient or commute or whatever. But a lot of people chose, even if it's not the organization, they chose the function that they're in because there's something about it that they love. There's something about it that inspires them. And simply figuring out how to survive every day does not tend to return any kind of energy towards you. So there's not that feeling of, I, you know, yeah, I worked 14 hours today, but I, I, I accomplished this thing. It's more of like I, I weeded through a bunch of stuff and I'm just trying to stay afloat or make sure my manager thinks that I'm, I'm productive or that I keep my job. Um, all those things don't really have the return on investment or that, that reciprocal energy um, where you feel satisfied. And, and so I've always said, like, I can work all day from morning till night. But if I feel like I did something meaningful, the next day I'm charged up, I'm ready to go. If the whole day was just stress and fear and anxiety and, you know, worried about, you know, appearing a certain way because I don't know what people are perceiving when I'm working from home. Um, or I don't know, you know, I've got people making decisions about whether they're going to furlough people and all that's in there. Um, I, I, it's just, everything's more exhausting. And you've also got people who are, who are very, very stressed and sometimes even in a panic state about whether or not they're going to get um, the coronavirus. And, you know, I, 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 I don't say this flippantly, but, but I mentioned before that I, I have it, I have had it and I, I had mild symptoms. I was just kind of relieved to know that that's, what, that's as bad as what I was going to experience. Whereas those of us who haven't had it, it's, um, it's scary. Uh, we don't know how everybody's body reacts differently. So you've just got all that going on. So I really want to emphasize, you need to pick a destination. Now, I recommend picking a destination for the end of the year. Thinking to yourself, first as a leader, do I have a vision of what we could accomplish this year? And can I, can I be brave enough to say, I have no idea if we're going to be able to accomplish this? everything so up in the air. The truth of the matter is you have to embrace that the world has always been uncertain. It's just we've gotten a really harsh reminder of how uncertain things can be because we've never seen anything like this between COVID, between the civil rights unrest, everything all at once, and now the economy. Um, it's a lot for folks, but we've always been operating in uncertainty. It's just our, our patterns are, have been thrown out the window and now we're really kind of raw up against it. So this idea of why would I pick a goal for the end of the year when I have no idea if I can make it? Well, every time you pick a goal, you have no idea if you're going to be able to make it. You don't have any idea what's going to happen when you walk out the door every day. It, it, the idea is to have something to pull your energy around and to treat the environment as part of the obstacle course versus just this storm you're constantly reacting to and you don't know which wave's going to hit next. Uh, so instead of treading water, let's go sail somewhere. So first as a leader, you picking, what are some tangible things, some impact that we would love to be able to make? And not the, the impact that maybe we wanted to make in 2019, maybe so, but more the impact that we think based on everything going on, what could our function really do to support? So this goes to, a lot of you are familiar with his work, um, but this goes to, uh, you know, the why, how, what, this, the golden circle um, uh, that, yeah, pick a destination means pick a goal. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but it is about, you know, what are we, what are we going after? And so um, Simon Sinek's, uh, first of all, you can, you can look up his video, Simon Sinek's Start With The Why. He's also got a book uh, based on this really great. He does a good job explaining it, but it's the, the idea that the why, how, what, that we usually start with the what, um, and then maybe the how, and then we leave out the why. Uh, and he, he uh, emphasizes the importance of starting with the why, and then figuring out the how and the what. Um, and so I'm recommending that you think this through as an individual, uh, but that you also do this with your direct reports or as, as large of a, a scope of a team that you have, that they get to do this as a bit of a brainstorm. You can do it virtually. Uh, but that they get to participate in this so that they're connected to something bigger than, than just that day. How do they get through it? I, I picked December because there's something about a close out of a year. And we're really at like kind of a five, five, six, not quite six, but five months, four months 
And that's a good chunk of time to try to try to focus. If you just pick a month or a week, um, a lot of times it starts to be very task oriented and it's very easy to get sucked into, well, I'm, I'm gonna, this month I'm gonna focus on whether or not this policy comes through from, from the city or the state versus four months from now, I've gotta actually have a long range plan for what I'm gonna do. And then everything coming from the outside, I take into account and I look at, is that an obstacle? Is that an opportunity? Versus just what's coming at me is the goal, surviving that as the goal. So that's why I want us to think a little bit more long range. I get, at least my experience has been that people feel like shooting a year out from now feels a little too disconnected from, from reality. Um, but I think you should shoot out at least to the end of the year and, and people tend to feel comfortable with like closing the end of the year. What do we want to say we've done? Um, so some things to think about and, and I like to ask the question of what future are we fighting for? And so um, it could be something simple as at, by the end of this year. And I really encourage you guys to look at what do you and your team have the most control over? So you cannot control what's going on with state. You definitely can't control what's going on with coronavirus. Um, and you won't be able to control necessarily what's going on with the civil unrest. But when you think of your function, if you're in accounting, if you're in legal, what is it that you could go, you know, no matter what, with this even with this environment going on or because this environment is going on, um, our department should really be good at this by the end of the year. We should be delivering on this by the end of the year. Um, we're also, it can be, you know, the why, the how, the what, you know, what do we really care about? Why were we in this business in the first place? That doesn't change just because things are uncertain right now. That's the why. And then the how, you know, let's talk about how we commit to operating in this time of stress. How are we going to support each other? And then the what, what are we going to deliver by the end of the year? Um, so we have something tangible to stand by and work towards and prioritize our time around. Um, so I am, I am gonna throw this at, at, at you all as a question and feel free to send it in a private chat or Q and A if you don't wanna share it because you've got some you know, copyright worthy kind of inventions out there. But what is the tangible deliverable that you'd really love to be able to produce by the end of this year? And this, you know, be, be, be a little childlike in this. You know, don't quickly go to, well, I'd love to do this, but it'll never happen because you know, our organizations in chaos or our world is in chaos. Just forget all that for now, but just what would you love to be able to, to say you and, and your team were able to deliver or do or impact? This is the stuff that kind of gives you energy. This is the stuff that, that, you know, why you signed up for the gig in the first place. And, and you can say, you know, I would really like us, you know, I don't know, maybe you guys are in charge of, um, um, office situations, you can say, I'd, I'd love us to be in a situation where we were all set up that people can come back to work um, as they needed because our environment was set up that way. Um, but if you're not in charge of that, I, I would say that's a nice thought, like, wow, I'd love for that to see that happen, but really focus on the things that you're in charge of. Um, okay, so we've got a couple of people, create a safe, healthier environment um, for the return to work. Okay, so if you're, if you're, um, it, you know, if you and your team kind of help make that happen, I think that's a, a great way. And I would say, how do you break that down to some tangible things that you could go by December? I want to see all conference rooms outfitted for in-person meetings. Um, I, I want us to see that we are um, set up to uh, have antibacterial stations um, in, in every office, you know. So this is a situation where you've got your goal, but really kind of give some tangibles for it. And you want to help your team. I'm having you guys think about this ahead of time so you have something in your mind. But when you do this with your team, you really want them to be able to take the lead a little bit on what they think this is. And then you can throw in your two cents. Uh, but you want to, a lot of people will get stuck on, I just, you know, I want us to be the best in the business. And it's like, that's great. But what would that look like in December? Uh, we should be able to master providing therapy sessions via Zoom. Yeah. Uh, especially, uh, Shelly, for the work that your organization does. So to be able to move into something like that online, which the reality is, no matter what happens with um, COVID, that really, that really sets up, um, that could be amazing in terms of what work that might open up for all of you, 
just moving forward. Um, uh, deliver on my goals, the projects uh, that I'm working on with and for my colleagues at, at, at TE. Yeah. And, and, you know, think bigger on that. Like, so as an individual, there's the, there's the goals, um, but also make sure that you're thinking collectively as a team, what could we do collectively as a team? Because you want people to feel like they're rallied around something together. Uh, we should be comfortable with remote work policies and best practices in place. Yeah, everyone kind of got thrown into remote work, which, you know, a lot of us probably should have been doing uh, more of this uh, and, and play, playing with this a little bit more um, previously. But now we've been thrown into it and there is a lot of gray area because it's not remote work, even in the sense of because your job kind of has a lot of travel or that type of thing. It's remote work when everyone's kind of sheltered at home. So to have some policies around how that lines up with personal uh, life, the fact that you can't really mandate the same kind of schedules that you could of like a nine to five coming into the office when people, especially if they got kids at home and that type of thing. So figuring out how do you put some policy around all this gray? Um, okay, and so hopefully, you know, as you guys think about this, really, um, you know, think about like, what could you deliver? What could you create? Uh, what kind of impact would tell you you know what, this was a, a heck of a wild storm. And I look back on 2020 and I think here are the things I'm proud of, um, of our team collectively. And that could be that we stay focused on the why we do the work, the purpose behind it. And right now, it's really critical that you speak from the why with your team, that you constantly remind them the why they're in this. And it's not about just surviving you know, COVID, it's bigger than that. There was, there was something they cared about before COVID came along. The how, how are we committing to show up when we're stressed, when we need support? Are we committing to raising our hands? Are we committing to reaching out? Are we committing to really sticking to an assumption of good intent, even though, um, you know, a lot of us, and I raise my hand, um, can become quite neurotic when we're not talking to people and seeing their nonverbals on a regular basis. So emails get taken a certain way. And it's just stress that we don't need. Um, and then the, the what, what are some, you know, maybe top three things that we can say that are kind of meaty, um, that, are, that we have a good amount of control over or influence that, that we're not reliant on everything on the outside working perfectly, that we can kind of move forward with this. This doesn't maybe erase some of the day-to-day -day stuff that people have to do, but it does give that kind of, these are the things we hope we pull through for the year. Now, if your team is doing a lot of day-to-day -day management, then you, know, you don't wanna just add extra projects on top of stuff that feels a little like just extra stress, but you wanna make it meaningful. You wanna, and it could just be, you know, by the end of the year, we're gonna have some really efficient processes around these three areas because they're critical to the business and we're the ones in charge of it. And so we're gonna look for how to make this efficient and streamlined and easy for people to leverage. That way it still is within people's day to day, um, but it really, it really um, ties to elevating. Another thing that you all can think about is, is branding. Some of, some of you work in organizations and your department's not leveraged the way that you'd like it to be. So getting clear as to what are the services that we really provide that we want people reaching out to us for, let's get clear on that. What are our standards, our service standards? And then how do we go about kind of connecting with other people in the organization at this time, leveraging this time to provide services in a way that people feel like, wow, you were really useful during that time. And I got to understand what your team does that maybe previously that didn't exist. Okay. Um, so some questions. Um, and I, you know, I've got some cute little uh, baby feet here because in this situation, we're probably not gonna go off on a, um, a, a sprint here. This may be some baby steps. But when you think of the next four to five months, uh, asking the team, what would, prog what would um, progress look like by the end of this year? And you, know, you can kind of map it out. Hey, by September, where do we wanna be? By November, what do we wanna see? And then December, what's the stuff that we wanna be able to look at and touch and feel and, and point to? Uh, so it's not just, we're going to be the best team, you know, by the end of the year. That's not enough for people to kind of get their heads wrapped around. Okay. Another question to ask and work with the team, and this is going to all be on a cheat sheet that you'll get, is uh, what role can the team play setting up the company for success by the end of this year? So where do you fit in that, that domino's um, uh, path? 
And then the last one, what is working in the team's favor in this COVID-19 economy? And the reason I say that is it's extremely easy to uh, go through and I'm just pointing out all the things that are wrong, all the things that are getting in the way. Um, and, I, and I find, especially in times like this where people are stressed, you actually have to force people to look at opportunity. What, in all of this chaos, there is opportunity that maybe we didn't have before. Maybe before it was like changing the constitution to get people to do a new, a new thing. And now because everything's just kind of been ripped apart, it's a lot easier to push through new, new ways of doing things. Let's take advantage of that and get some of this stuff that we've been trying to get uh, you know, approved. Now we can show how relevant it is. I mean, look how fast everybody went to remote work. And I can tell you from working in HR, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, getting people to accept a work from home policy was very tough. And then all of a sudden everybody went there. Um, oh, so the previous question um, uh, was, what role can the team play setting up the company for success? And uh, just for you guys' reference, I have this in a nice little PDF that I'll send for all of you. It has all these little sample questions that I have. Um, so you'll, you'll have that. Um, okay, so that's, that's step one. Let's just pick that destination. Find what we're going to shoot for for the end of the year. Work and brainstorm with the team so they're part of it, so they get to participate in what that looks like. And then um, the next thing is we're going to start discussing expectations. This is, this is a time where you've really got to revisit. The truth is some of you are on calendar performance evaluations, calendar year performance evaluations. So June and July are ideal times for a mid-year mid check-in. If you, if you haven't already, because everyone's just been kind of operating in chaos, this is a critical time to meet one-on-one -on -one with folks. And you can, you can do it as a team and go, what do we need to expect from each other moving forward? This is gonna be our, this is gonna be kind of consistently uncertain for the next couple of months. And so we can't just keep kind of putting things off and not discussing them. So as a team with that, you know, the why, how, the how is that time of like, what, what are we committing to being able to expect from one another? But then as a manager that you're sitting one-on-one -on -one, and if you are not a manager, that you reach out. I'm a, I'm a big proponent for those of you who sat through my performance management classes. I'm a very big proponent of the in, individual treating performance management as, look, this is, this is your business that you're running. You're just decided to work for another organization. So that your manager is actually your primary client. And I use performance management not as a, is my manager happy with me, but more of a, does my, is, is what my client's expecting from me, does it line up with what I'm delivering? Let me share with them updates and see if they, you know, if there's issues or there's a gap between what they're looking for and what I'm delivering. It's not a, I want them to pat me on the back. It's more of a, are we on the same page? If not, let's, let's figure it out. And let me take the lead on making that happen as part of my service. Um, but as a manager during times like this, especially if you haven't set it up to be that kind of dynamic, there is, there is a kind of a, an expectation that's out there um, that there's some level of care and feeding coming from the managers. And I know that as a manager, you're probably going, well, who's care and feeding for me? Um, this is kind of the tough part about being uh, you know, a leader is you're not always getting that care and feeding from your own leadership the way that you would like it. But for the frontline staff um, and you know, for maybe the, the, the layer right above that staff, I always feel like they're on the front lines there's a certain amount of kind of direction setting that they're looking for, a certain amount of, do I matter to this company? I don't, I don't come into the hallway every day. I don't get to see everybody every day. I get some random emails and sometimes those emails seem a little short and aloof. So do, do people care? If not, I got a lot of time and um, room in my own house to let my brain go into a not so healthy place. So, you know, checking in right now and discussing expectations and really kind of setting the tone of like, we're going to operate as a business, even though it's not going to look the way that we did it before. We're still an organization that needs to do things. Or if we're not accomplishing things, and I don't mean this to be, I don't mean it to be scary, but I mean it to be a healthy reality check. Every organization out there, if yours hasn't already, has to evaluate costs at this point in a way uh, beyond what we've had to do in the past. Um, and so at some point, those of you who kind of went through your careers during 2008's economic downturn or after 9-11 um, and the, the crash that happened after that is um, everybody remembers what it was like for organizations to start to just make cuts and streamline and, and reorg. And that became a little bit more of a norm than we had ever seen before. 
we're, we're going to see that now. We've already seen companies furlough. My thing in that is I don't want to sit scared with my team. I remember around 2008 when there were cutbacks, we, um, as HR, we were the ones that kind of were kept around. Those of you in HR know this feeling of, you know, kept around and we did a lot of the blue envelopes, you know, that folders, that type of thing. And then we got an email um, and the head of the department said, please send me a list of everybody on your team and everything those people do. And I thought to myself, this is the wrong way for us to approach it because a lot of what we do today won't be necessary in the future. So instead, what we did is we put together a plan of this is our strategic plan for what we're looking to do for the organization in the next year. And that was in all kinds of uncertainty and people were getting reorged and laid off and not to this level of uncertainty, but still. So we had a strategic plan in place. And then in the appendix, I had a list of here's what they do today. But in the strategic plan, there was the list of what they would be doing in the future and how it would support the organization. Now, I'll never know. We didn't get touched um, for layoffs. And, and maybe that's because they saw us as a strategic uh, part of the future and, and all positions had a necessary business case behind it. Or we were just too high maintenance and it was easier to cut other departments. I will not know. I do not know for sure. Uh, but I will say we were able to keep our personnel and um, were able to move into that future strategic plan. So that's what I want to emphasize is now's the time to start, if you haven't already, get back to operating as a strategic unit and a team, because they're going to be looking for what are you, why do we have you, why are we paying you, and can we do without, and that's not cold-blooded, it's not meant to, companies don't care about us, it's just unfortunately we're, we're, there's going to be some level of survival decisions that need to be made as an organization. So if your team is, is strategic, you got a better chance of, of being there for the right reason. You know, you're not just making up a strategy, but you're there for the right reason. So um, I'd love to hear from all of you, what expectations of your employees are you feeling frustrated about? So things that you're expecting from them that you're just not seeing happen. And maybe ego-wise, you even know that you don't really have a right to expect that with everything going on, but it's still frustrating and that's okay too. What are some things that are popping up for folks? Uh, worried about uh, people just not communicating and not updating the way that they that, that you need, especially since they're working from home. Okay. What are some other things that your employees, and you know what, feel free to throw out there, you know, even managers. Uh, ah, okay, this is a good one. Folks that want to get promoted to leadership positions, but a lot uh, harder to take on leadership responsibilities from home. Uh, that's interesting. Um, you know, uh, I think it's really important to, to talk about um, what promotions look like for, for, you know, right now. So it's interesting because I go back to, I had an employee who, who kept kind of coming to me. It was around, it, back around 2008 and the economic downturn. And there were hiring freezes across the organization. And they kept kind of going, well, you know, I want to know when I'm going to get promoted. And I said, you know, there's hiring freezes everywhere. I have no problem. And I annually have a discussion with them about where they, what kind of impact do they want to make? And, um, and, but they, but he kept kind of coming back to, when am I going to get promoted? When am I going to get promoted? And I had to have a, a conversation with him. I said, the thing is, is there's no business case for us to have a higher level position right now. And, and if I move you into something, even if I go and I fight for you because you've been a, a long time employee and you've always worked hard, you are the first that'll be on the chopping block because we don't have a sound business case around why that position, not you in that position, but why that position exists. And so what I'd rather do is let's focus on what kind of impact you like to make. And if there's a title thing that's getting in the way of you being able to make that impact, let's talk about it. But in that, we're creating a business case for you to be, for us to have that position because you're starting to create demand in that area. Now that's different than I'm just gonna give them work and then never fight for them to get paid for it. But when they, when they come from that place of like, I wanna get promoted, it's a little bit of that hamster wheel of, I did good work in 11th grade, where's my promotion to 12th grade? And for those of you coming to the career webinar, we'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow. Um, but I will, what I will do is I'm gonna include uh, my motivation conversation worksheet that I have that I, I, I do this annually. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with you doing this as a check-in with your staff right now. 
and going, let's talk about this. In there, in the worksheet, there's no discussions about what title do you want. It's all about what motivates you, what makes you feel rewarded, and um, what kind of impact do you want to make by the, you know, by the end of the year or this year. And you could talk to them and say, you know, I, I like to, I, I want to have a more meaningful conversation around what is the impact that they want to make and why do they see this position as the only way to do that. And I'm not against people wanting to move up. I want them to have a solid why. And not because for me, but because I know I've sat in HR. I want to make sure that there's a strong business case for any position that we put them in. But I would have an honest conversation to them about, let's talk about what leadership needs are there right now. Um, and, and, you know, I'd hate to burn out the opportunity of me putting you up for something and it doesn't make business sense. And then now it's not tied to something meaningful versus us just kind of working on impact. And then when the opportunity is right, then, then it makes sense because I can make this great business case of look at all the things that you've already stretched into. Um, I stand by that I think it's a lot easier to do a title correction in an organization than it is to get a promotion through, especially if that position doesn't currently exist. So you're not just backfilling them into some, you know, someone left and they're moving into an EVP position or a VP or whatever title it happens to be. Um, you're trying to promote someone into, say, a director position, and you don't have director headcount for that position. It's easier to do a title correction later, so if they are actually building the work and demand. But then they have to trust you, and you have to work with them and partner with them, that this is not you just shining them off and saying, do more work, get paid less, and you know, someday I'm gonna, I'm gonna hook you up with something. Uh, you know, I keep in contact with them, and we talk about it, and I say, look, if you, Truth of the matter is, is if you build all kinds of demand and there's a strong business case for you to be moved into a director position, and for some reason they're not going to give a director headcount to our department, then let's talk about what that next opportunity is for you. But what's great about that is you didn't spin your wheels. You've actually been developing director skills so that you are more marketable. I don't want to lose you. I don't think the company wants to lose you, but I'm very realistic. If we're not able to provide what this person's looking for and they've been delivering you know, above and beyond, then I'm gonna help them move on to the next step. Maybe later they can come back when, when the position's right. Um, but that's a little bit more of that promotion talk. So I don't wanna to, to digress, but I want you, want you all to think about that. Not making productivity numbers. Um, and I think that's where, you know, in your, if you're in your head, if you're thinking, look, this should be doable. I'm seeing other people do this. Um, I think first and foremost, having a conversation of, what is it that they're doing to set up productivity in their home? What's working for them? What's not working for them? And, um, you know, where do they see the biggest challenges? And if that conversation, and not, not to, I don't ever say like, what can I do to help you or whatever? I just, I want to know, like everybody here should be having a productivity conversation with their staff as part of this kind of expectations thing. What, how are you setting yourself up to be productive? What kind of challenges are you meeting at home that you didn't expect? And you don't know how to work around. Um, <laughs> no, no, no frustrations. You just want to stay employed. I, I do not blame you. <laughs> and even with that, like, I think that's a great, even coming from that perspective of like, how do I stay employed? Um, I have, I've definitely, because I've been on the receiving end of those blue envelopes as well. I've learned that um, in times like this, this is not the time. And I, I see a lot of people get like this. This is not the time to sit and wait and go, well, we're just waiting things out. We want to wait, you know, wait to see what happens. In my mind, I'm like, there's got to be, even while we're waiting, what are those things that we can invest some time in that are low cost or no cost, um, but really be productive so that when someone does turn around and look to our department to do something, either one, we've got some stuff ready to go, or two, our train is always out of the station. We're not stagnant. And I, I, I say that from experience from, from, as I mentioned before, being in HR in 2008 and seeing a lot of departments that were like, well, our leader left or they got laid off and we don't know. So we're waiting for the new leader. And I'm like, get the train out of the station because whatever happens, either the new leader shows up or we get folded into somebody else. You want to show that these are all the things that you've been doing to support the organization this idea of just waiting for someone to tell us what to do. It, you don't have the luxury for that in this kind of airspace. Um, not responding within an hour of the email, even though they are the theoretically at work. I think this is, you know what, this is, this is one of the most common ones that I hear is, is why aren't they responding faster? Um, they're technically supposed to be clocked into work. And, you know, 
I would, I would look at it this way. I encourage everybody to sit and have a conversation. And I'm gonna show you the questions uh, similar to the last step. I've got some questions laid out. But really asking and going, what, is, what do they think is realistic to in terms of responsiveness? And where do they see some challenges? And, um, and then what are my expectations? And unless they are answering calls to clients from nine to five, and you're seeing that they're not available to the clients, you, you may need to, to relax a little bit of the expectation that you may have had if they were sitting at a desk. Even if they don't have children um, at home, it's just a, it is a little bit of a different vibe. Now, if you're saying like, look, you know, I would like to, between these hours, I'd like to know that these emails are gonna be answered and here's why. I, I do think it needs to be a dialogue because on the other end, people are saying, you know, yeah, she was upset because I didn't answer in, in, in an hour, but I honestly, I was up till midnight the night before and, and working and I was exhausted. So I took a nap. And then when I got up, I had like five emails from her and she was angry. And it's like really gauge because I, I don't know if, if unless they're tied to a call center kind of environment that people are really doing a nine to five. Now, if what I like to come to is not necessarily the how, but the, the, the what is missing. So whether you answer me in an hour or not is not my concern. What is the impact that I'm concerned about? That's what I want to talk about. So if I say, you know, I'm having a hard time getting, you know, in our, in our office, there's a lot of kind of fires that are going on that we have to put out. And I can't respond quickly um, to people because I'm waiting for your answer. And so in those situations, if it's if it's in the scenario where I really need immediate uh, response from you, what's going to be our communication connection? Because email clearly isn't isn't the way. Can we do that if I text you that you have your phone on you probably a little bit more, and you might be checking text a little bit more than email, or that I'm going to call you directly, and that please when you get a call from me, understand that this is a timely, and I won't call you past 5 p.m. and I won't call you on weekends. Whatever that agreement is. But the, the big part of it is getting together and talking about it because assuming that just because now they're at home, they should still be operating on a nine to five. I don't think that's fair. I honestly don't think it's realistic. Um, I, I think you have to talk to each individual and find out what the reality is of their home life and figure out and share your concerns and together come up with how are you going to fix that. Um, people not motivated and just trying to survive and go through the day. Yeah, and I, it's, it is, it's tough. Um, this is where I say like finding something that can be the true north that everybody um, agrees needs to be focused on, but sometimes you've just got people who are in reactive mode. Um, I think that if you've got someone who's just, it seems like they're burned out, they're constantly like, it doesn't matter, things are negative and they're not, they're not full, you know, kind of delivering on anything. We're five months into this, we need to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And in that scenario, I, I think you have to be compassionate and say, I, I get it, this is hard, I have days. Um, and everybody's situation is different. We're still collecting a paycheck and somehow we have to make sure that we're delivering in a way that justifies that paycheck. And I wanna make sure that there's not a chance for anybody to, to question that. How do we make sure that we stay focused, that we're strategic? This isn't about me just trying to tr crack the whip on you. This is about me trying to make sure that our department gets to do the work that we signed up to do and um, that in this time of stress and uncertainty that we're looked at as a resource and I want you to be part of that story and you know I, I get the negativity I get the I get the kind of just even getting to a point of complacency but that's not helping us so and it's not going to help you so what are we going to do so that things stay productive how do we move forward and, and really just having, holding the mirror up and saying, I'm gonna have expectations. We've gotta be, I've gotta be able to, as a manager, start to have some expectations. I wanna consider your situation and be as compassionate and thoughtful as possible. But at the end of the day, it's not, it's not gonna help anybody if I just let everybody do whatever they're gonna do. Um, so just kind of having a reality check with them. Mixed priorities. I think this is one of the toughest ones of, what I recommend in that scenario is the tighter the group that you can go, here's what we're doing until December. And then understanding that, yes, if something comes in from, you know, state legislation that changes that, 
we'll meet, we'll discuss, what do we do differently? If the head of the organization all of a sudden changes gears and goes in a different direction, let's meet, let's talk about how does that impact? Does it actually impact what we were shooting for? Does it just shift the timing or the how we approach it? Um, I, I think there's something about having your own, like we're sailing to New York. She's now, you know, now the head of the organization is talking about getting to Europe, like, okay, um, we're traveling to Europe. What, why were we headed to New York? What was there? Can we, can we do that in Europe? Let's shoot for Europe, um, but keep our eye on that New York may be as far as we get. I know my geography is a little off. Please don't school me on my geography. I'm uh, clearly not the person who's teaching geography to my stepson. Um, okay, uh, will promotion be on the radar knowing that there is budget evaluation at this time and company wants to cut costs? You know, that's what's funny about this is I, I always go back to one, I would lose the word promotion. Promotion feels extra. Like it feels like it's on top of everything. I come from the place of strategically what sets this function up for success. So if someone's in a manager position and you know they're great at their job or whatever, that's great, but I'm not giving you a director position to reward you. I'm asking you to take a director's position on because that's what the department needs and I think you're set up to do that well. And so I think as an organization, I know that in tight budget times and even under the hiring freeze uh, around 2008 and then you know, also after 9-11, I got um, people's what I call title corrections put through because it made strategic sense. There was a business reason behind it. It wasn't just Sally deserves a promotion. It was for our learning department to have a director position. This is what it enables us to do. This is where it saves us money. This is where it maybe helps make things more efficient and, and, and deliver what we're supposed to deliver. And I'm recommending Sally in that position and here's why, and she's a good fit for it. And here's how we'll kind of backfill her position or rearrange others to kind of, you know, fill in whatever it is that she used to do. So I, I it'll probably be on radar in some areas. I would say that's, I think that's the weakest card to play. But if you come from a place that's strategically for 2021, this is our game plan, this is what I'm recommending, and this is what I'm recommending my org chart looks like and my head count looks like, and who would sit where and why. That I found was a much easier, because not only would my manager be able to propose that easier, the people who might have to approve that through um, benefits and, and pay, they, you know, they usually have some sort of form that they have to fill out for a justification for those types of things. And so, I, you know, I would really, in times like this, when things are tight, I find it's a lot harder to make the case of, I'm doing this because I don't want to lose them. Um, you know, they're great employees and we want to reward them. That feels a lot weaker to come from than this is just the way that, that, the, that the business needs to run or the organization needs to run. And it just makes sense to move the pieces this way. Um, for that, for if you're thinking either for yourself or for another individual, for um, you know, when there's a budget evaluation, I'd really start to talk about you know here's why in the future this is what it should look like for 2021, and this is how I can support making that happen. Um, but I always pitch the work and the impact, and then I give a business rationale as to why that position should be a certain title and why a certain person should sit in that position. Um, that I have found has worked and I was able to see a lot of headway in areas where other people, it was almost like, you know, they were, you know, begging for this, you know, can I please promote this person or whatever. And it's, it just, it doesn't go over the same way. Uh, remotely seems to allow customizing and prioritizing out duties and employee, the, the employee didn't like and editing out hard to know that it is happening or how to approach the dialogue. This is, and this is tough, but I, this is where I think having the expectations conversation, and I'm going to have some simple questions in there uh, for you guys to use. But this is where I like to ask them, you know, what is it that they're expecting um, around these three topics that I'm going to show you? And I share the same thing. So they can share their expectations of themselves as well as of me as their manager. And then I'm going to share, here's what I'm expecting of you. Here's what I'm expecting of myself as a manager. Let's pay attention to where are the, the gaps? Where do you think it needs to look one way? And I think it needs to look another. And then let's discuss how to close the gap. That's not me. I always say feedback is not about the person. Feedback is about the performance. I'm not saying you're a bad employee. I'm not saying you're lazy. I'm not even entering into that, but I am letting you know, I'm not getting these things delivered 
I don't know the reason, I'm happy to listen to it, but what I want is a solution. And I'm happy to help you find that solution. But we need to solve for the deliverable, not for your personality, because that's not my job. Um, uh, let's see here. I see that there's uh, no real work day, but rather the work is being done over a 24 hour period and not between nine to five anymore. Yeah, and everybody's different. Um, I just, I, like I said, you're gonna have your people where it feels like they just disappeared and they're not doing anything. Um, more often than not, you've got people who are working at different hours. I like to go back to, look, in, unless I'm working in, and I've worked in call center environments or like retail where you really, it's, it really is about hours on the floor, um, then you're dealing with, did the work get done? And I think the more that you focus on, did the work get done, you get to take the anxiety out of, as you as a manager, am I on top of them enough? Because I think that's some of the anxiety is, you know, you're judged by how well your people perform. And so that level of, am I checking in enough? Am I not checking in enough? Um, <coughs> am, I, am I doing my job? And instead, it really kind of gauging, what are the deliverables I need to see that tells me that things are being productive, that the deadlines are being met? And if that's not happening, it goes back to uh, earlier, I think, Lynn, you brought up the question of, you know, how do I address this? You address, this isn't being delivered, and this is, this is what's expected, and this needs to be done. Um, and, and I'm more than willing to be compassionate that maybe what's happening is you're stressed or even depressed at home. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to talk about any of that. But at some point, and ideally in this conversation, we have to solve for you and I both need to be able to say that our department delivers and that we're participating the way that we're getting paid to participate. And I don't do that as a, look, if you're not going to do it, then you're going to lose your job. I'm not trying to threaten anybody, but reality is reality. Like it's going to shake out that way. And I think a lot of us, I know some of you that I'm, I'm looking up here that I, I can see uh, that are on here work in organizations that in some of those situations, nobody lost their job. You know, some, some of you uh, your organizations didn't get hit hard after 9-11 or 2008. And now people are kind of, you know, they're used to just kind of having this job security that no matter what, no one really loses their job unless they set fire to something. Um, I, don't, I don't think anyone's uh, going to walk out safe um, where they can say, like, I'm untouchable um, at this point in time. Even some of you all that work with unions there's going to be some level of, yeah, deliverables are going to have to be met. It just comes down to the money's not going to be there unless we're going to be able to produce, even in a nonprofit organization, you've got to be able to get donations. And if there's a strain on those donations, decisions will have to be made. Um, but the good thing is, is if people are strategic about creating demand for things and creating efficiencies, then it doesn't have to necessarily be just a crazy cutting um, it can be a really thoughtful conversation and it might even be that you created demand over in another area that no cuts need to be made. Um, but I just, I, I think, I think it's, I think it's part of a manager's job to be able to have a realistic conversation. Now, I always say couple the reality check with let's talk about what's possible. Let's talk about what we can do to make the future more of what we want versus everything's just about what we don't want. Um, but I, I want to have that conversation. I don't want to just hear like, you know, like, I don't know what you're talking about. This is happening. Like, either I got the email or I didn't. Either they got the product or they didn't. Like, that's where I like to live because that's tangible. This other area of whether or not you were goofing off at home and out with the family and not, I don't even want to, I don't want to babysit. I had an employee once who she reported to somebody else and she was an intern at the time and she worked four days a week. And she had Fridays off and she would go to school on Fridays. She started reporting to me when she got um, made salary. And she, one of our first conversations, you know, what is she looking for from a manager, blah, blah, blah. And she said, my concern is, is that I used to leave early on Fridays to go to school and I still kind of need to do that. Is that going to be an issue? And I just kind of chuckled at her. I said, I don't know what to tell you. Your salary. So you, as far as I'm concerned, all I want are the things delivered. What you do to make that happen is on you. And I'm like, the reason I'm laughing is you're about to realize how bad at time management you probably are. And because before you had to clock out, the company made you clock out because you were a paid intern and you could only work so many hours. You were not the person that was disciplined and left at a certain time and set healthy boundaries for yourself. The company did it for you. We've just removed all of that. 
and your salary now. So you are in danger of working till two in the morning because no one's telling you to stop. You go take off and, and go do some classes on Friday. I don't care. I'm not here to babysit but I will be talking to you if I'm not seeing things get delivered the, you know, at the deadlines and at the timing that we agreed to. And that's exactly what she ran into that year is just working super late, working on the weekends. And we had, I had to really work with her on how to set boundaries. So um, I think a lot of our staff is actually dealing with that and trying to figure out how to manage being at home. And even mentally you're at home, you want to relax, but then you got to work. Maybe you're not living in a situation where you have a separate office. You've got to work inside your dining room table. And that's a completely different mindset than being in an office. Um, so I'm not saying cut complete slack. I'm just saying I would come to this mid-year conversation with a, I'm assuming good intent on all ends, but I want us to be productive and I want us to be on the same page. So how do we do that? And not a, I'm suspect that you're, you know, goofing off or whatever. Just here's what needs to get done. How do we think we can make that a reality? So these are the questions. So I, this was a viral video. I think some, and what's this, this is hilarious is this viral video was what last year? And this was the gentleman, I think he was a news reporter on BBC and his kid comes in and then another kid comes in and then his wife kind of sneaks in and grabs the kids. And you know, it went viral because you know, he's shooing the kids away as he's trying to do this broadcast and everyone thought it was so funny. And now, this is everyone's day-to-day -day reality. But um, so that's the, yeah, it was absolutely, it was hilarious. And now like all of us have probably had moments like that. Um, so what will productivity look like? I really recommend that you sit down and go like January through this time. It doesn't mean that you just throw it out and you ignore it. Um, I think you can talk about, here's what I, I, you can even do a little recap. Here's through all this chaos. Here's what I really appreciated that you did and navigated and here's, you know, here's some questions that I had or things that made me kind of concerned. And so let's talk about moving forward for the rest of the year. What does productivity look like? What's a realistic way for things to be productive? What do I need to see from you? What do you need to see from yourself? And then what do you need to see from me? And what do I need to see from me? So having that discussion, so some of you guys are saying like, I feel like they're kind of cutting bait, not doing what they're supposed to do. This is a way to broach that subject and say, we're going to have a, a mid-year check-in and we're going to game plan for the next six months. And you can even say that in a team meeting so everyone knows it's coming. But what will productivity look like? It's probably going to be a little bit chaotic like this gentleman and his children. And it's not going to be as neat and clean as we would when we can just kind of go, you're in the office. I expect Ted and I's committed to the computer doing your job, whatever it is. Um, next. What will be the approach to communication and collaboration? So what expectations do, do each of you have around frequency of communication? So to your point, I was expecting an answer within an hour on my emails and I'm not getting them. Um, this idea around um, you know, how we work together, what's collaboration look like? I, I'd like to talk about like, when the, I would even open it up, like what's been the hardest about working with me um, throughout all this COVID stuff. What's the one thing you'll see in the little uh, motivation conversation worksheet. I always have that. What's the one thing I'm doing that's making things easier for you? What's the one thing that I'm doing that's making things difficult? I would do that for during this COVID time and, and then reciprocate. This is the one thing you've done that's really been helpful for me. This is the one thing that you've done or not done that's made things difficult for me. Um, so that's a way that you can kind of bring that up. And then the, the next one is what kind of support is needed from one another? So what do you need from them? What do they need from you? Um, the, the, when, you when you're at the productivity conversation, this is what you can talk about, like what does productivity look like on a day-to-day -day basis? And then at the end of the year, what would tell us any of this stuff worked? What are we hoping you know, for their role? So I think earlier, Amy mentioned, like I wanna, I wanna meet my goals and I wanna get that done by the end of the year and support the team. So for her as an individual, what are those goals? For you, for, for your individual, when you're talking to them one-on-one, -on -one, what are those goals? You do the, what's our destination, step one with the team, and then in the one-on-ones, you find out what does that mean for each individual? But I, I like them to lead with that, and I give in my two cents, but I, I try to, you know, I, I delegate to them that that is their job to drive and come up with, and then I give them feedback on it, on whether it aligns with what I was expecting. And if they're like, I'm going to create the XYZ project, and I'm thinking, that's a waste of time. I, that's, that's the worst thing to work on during all this. I want them to work on the ABC project. Then I just tell them, 
I'm looking at the ABC project. You want to do the XYZ project. I, I, I don't think that's the right thing to work on. How do we close the gap on this? Like, why do you feel like that's the priority? And they may say, I don't know. I was just trying to pick something. So you get my back. Um, I'm fine with doing the ABC project. Um, but you want to hear why, but I always go to, it's not, their answer is not wrong. My answer is not necessarily right. I'm just, there's a gap. That's my concern. The fact that that gap is there and I want to close it. And it might be that I'm wrong. So by, by focusing on the gap, I'm less likely to just come in there machine gunning and saying they're wrong and they're going to go, why did you make me do this anyways if you already had your answer? Um, okay, so that's for the kind of touch base with them. I'm keeping the questions simple. Like I said, I'll send you the motivation conversation worksheet that has some more that you can kind of touch base in. But I th think keeping these conversations a little bit clean, a little bit simple so that it doesn't get confusing and we don't go down a lot of rabbit holes. You want just some kind of compass points for people to shoot for that you know three things like what's productivity look like what's communication and collaboration expectations and then what's support those are things that you can reference in your one-on-ones moving forward very easily like you know this is what we talked about in terms of productivity where are things at you know in terms of communication and collaboration how are we doing there and in terms of support how are we doing there it makes it very predictable and in this kind of crazy environment you want things to feel predictable so your one-on-ones should feel like they know exactly what they're walking into. What gets shared in those topics might change every time you meet and might not be as predictable, but the fact that that's what you'll be discussing in your one-on-ones, um, that sets up that there's a little bit of a routine that they can, they can rely on. Okay, um, and then step three is agree to a functional performance management process. So what does that look like? So here's what my uh, question is, what is, what have you been doing or not doing? Like, what's it, how's, you, how's it been dis discussing performance the past few months? Has it been hands off? Has it been kind of touchy? Has it been, actually you guys have been discussing performance easily or everyone's just been kind of doing their thing. No one's really sat down and discussed performance. And when I say discuss performance, it's not, did we meet a deadline? Did we, you know, do this, literally sitting down and let's say I report to you and, and, and you and I had a video chat and you said, okay, Heather, Here's some things, here's some issues I had with your performance, or here's what I really appreciated about the performance that you did uh, this past month. Like really actually touching on my individual performance. What's that been like in the last couple of months? Hard, <laughs> yeah. What's been hard about it? Not knowing what's okay to talk about. You know? Not wanting to come down on people when things are tough. Yeah. Some things have been easy to talk about, okay. What else? Everybody else is not discussing. Uh, everybody's in such different situations. And that's where I'm recommending like as a team having kind of a broader discussion but really looking at that one-on-one -on -one and um, you know, you've got some people who've got kids at home and you've got some who are taking care of sick parents, um, some who are just living in a crowded space and, and maybe they don't even have the right equipment there because they're not in the office and their internet's not that great. Um, yeah, everyone's, and that's where I like to sit down and, and on that one-on-one, -on -one, what does productivity look like for them? And it's not about letting people off the hook and, you know, playing favorites or anything like that. But uh, if they've got, this is one of those tough things where there's, there's going to be a bit of a, a non-equalizer because let's say like for my situation, I don't have any young kids at home. I have a, a 14 year old teenager who's, who's I've, I've groomed as my stepson to be extremely self-sufficient. So um, the, the good part is, is he's, it's, it's easy for him to be at home. It's not a hardship on, and for me to be home at the same time. Uh, but most people with kids aren't having that dynamic. And then there's a situation of you have one person that's got a newborn and you've got another person that doesn't have any of that. So maybe they're hitting it out of the park. I, I want you to keep that in mind that you, you, by the end of the year, and I don't know if your organization will end up doing performance reviews. They might even say, skip it for this year. I still think you have those conversations. I think you have to take into account the same way that you would previously take into account, this is what they were navigating in the workplace. So if one person was navigating an easy road and the other one was really kind of dealing with fires and issues and challenges, that's part of what I'm considering when I'm thinking about their, their review. 
in this scenario, this is what's going to be unique is that their work performance is being evaluated in their homes. So you have to take into consideration their home scenario. And if you've got, say, someone like me a couple of years ago when I lived by myself, it could be, you know, what's the hardest thing for you? And it might be just like a lack of human connection. So, hey, here's what you did really well that kind of kept you motivated and, 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 and not getting, you know, kind of in your little hole. And here's what you delivered in that time. Someone else, it might be, here's what you, what you delivered and communicated um, while you were navigating dealing with a newborn at home or you know, living in a crowded space, whatever that is, all, that, that does have to be taken into account. And the way that it shakes out is gonna be tough because this is where you wanna be clear in, the, in terms of the team around the how. What are the values that no matter what the person's situation, you expect them to commit to? So I expect people to show up with good intent. I think earlier it was like the person who maybe is just burned out and negative. I expect people to come with a focus on finding solutions. That has nothing to do with whether or not you have kids at home or whether or not you, you, you have you know, crappy internet. You can be focused on solutions in every conversation. I expect people to um, you know, engage and check in with me uh, once a week. No matter what their situation, they, they need to be able to find time to check in with you once a week. Um, so all those things you've got to think about, like, what are the things as a team you can say, everyone's expected to deliver this way. Um, that's going to be the equalizer because it's not going to be their work environment. Everyone's work environment's radically different and they're going to have to navigate different things. Okay. Uh, so here's some questions to consider. Uh, so what kind of recognition is, and this is going to be in the, um, in the, in the, um, uh, tip sheet that I gave. So what kind of recognition feels meaningful to each of us? What expectations aren't aligned? What do we need from one another? Um, how frequently will we uh, check in on the alignment of expectations? So weekly, monthly, that type of thing. Um, those are the three questions there. And so um, this is the sheet that you're going to all get. Um, it's got the first step, pick a destination, and the three questions that I listed. It's got discuss expectations and the three questions that I listed and then agree to a functional PM process, a performance management process. So you can even send this sheet to each of your team members and let them know during the one-on-one, -on -one, I want us to be able to address all nine of these questions in the discussion. And um, we're, gonna, we're gonna both be participating in that. Um, so what's, what's next? And I know I ran over a little bit on time, so I appreciate you guys hanging out. Um, I'm gonna send you the tip sheet. You'll get a, a link for the recording probably tomorrow. Um, you'll also get a survey, let us know what worked about this webinar, what more, what more kind of topics would you like to hear from. And uh, tomorrow, if you haven't already signed up, you can still sign up. It's Navigating Your Career in 2020. That's going to be at 10 a.m. And, um, and then um, we're here for you. So we, we do virtual coaching, workshops, team building, strategic planning, speaking engagements. All those things are still available if needed. Uh, and you can reach us here at our website as well as this phone number. And then that's my email if you need it. Thank you. Thank you very much for everybody coming in today. Um, really appreciate it. It was great to see a lot of your names pop up. I'm sorry that we didn't see everybody's faces. And, um, but uh, I really appreciate it. Best of luck to everyone. And hopefully this was helpful for you. Thank you. I'll hang out if anybody's got questions for a while. So. <laughs>